Hey folks, welcome to my studio. The rapid rise of AI has brought both excitement and dread to artists and non-artists alike. We sense new possibilities while fearing the potential fallout of our careers and artistic journeys. Technologies like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion now enable anyone, regardless of artistic training, to produce remarkable images using only text prompts. Non-artists can now access creative territories that previously required extensive training, while skilled artists benefit from a powerful tool that can enhance their creative workflow. However, this advancement can also be quite depressing for experienced artists who have already invested their lives into cultivating their skills, and discouraging for aspiring artists looking to begin their artistic journey. Like many other industries, artists face the potential risks of automation. One common question that arises is, why should an aspiring artist invest the time and energy into mastering traditional skills such as anatomy, proportion, perspective, composition, rendering, etc., when others might assume that their art was effortlessly created with a few clicks? On a societal level, there is concern about the increasing disconnection from reality caused by the digital world. With the growing ability of AI to shape culture, can an artistic training help us to navigate a world saturated with AI-driven illusions? In this video, I want to emphasize why I believe, one, artists who learn the fundamentals of drawing and painting will still be in a stronger position than those who don't. And two, the benefits of building an artistic foundation go beyond creating imagery. It also provides a powerful platform to shape our minds through the tools we learn. We're also gonna cover what I think are the three most important foundational pillars in drawing and painting in order to understand this second point. All right, let's begin with why it's still advantageous on a technical level to develop a strong foundation in the fundamentals, despite the capabilities offered by AI to everybody. Looking back in history, we can draw a parallel to the 1800s, a notable era in painting that coincided with the emergence of photography. Artists such as Mucha, Waterhouse, Bouguereau, and Klimt were prominent figures of that time, and they all used photography to varying degrees to inform their work. It is worth noting that photography during that period was still limited to black and white and relatively crude compared to today's standards. As a result, these artists were still required to problem solve many aspects of their compositions without relying solely on photography. This fusion of leveraging their skills honed in the traditional art world with the tools of the new era enabled those artists to achieve a remarkable breadth of ability. When I was in my 20s, I worked in the video games industry. And throughout that experience, as well as maintaining connections with colleagues over the years, I consistently observed that art directors often favored candidates who possessed a strong traditional foundation. This preference remained true even when the job primarily involved working with 3D modeling programs and other non-traditional tools. I once had a discussion about this with an art director and his response was, it's important to have a good eye, regardless of your role in the pipeline and a traditional foundation provides that. I think the same principle holds true when it comes to using AI technologies. Artists who possess a deep understanding of the fundamentals can more effectively harness the power of AI and leverage a wider spectrum of editing and customization capabilities. For instance, without the ability to perceive composition through abstraction and simplification, directing AI on that level is off the table, since the artist can't even think in those terms. This concept of developing a quote-unquote good eye leads us back to the essential topic of why building an artistic foundation holds greater significance beyond the acquisition of raw skills alone. So what does it mean to build a foundation in the fundamentals of drawing and painting? While this of course encompasses a wide range of skills and concepts, for the purpose of this video, I've condensed it down into what I believe are the three most essential pillars. Pillar number one, learn how to see, developing the skill of observation. Pillar number two, learn how to simplify, 
weaving together your observations with elegant simplification. And pillar number three, learn how to design using elegant simplification to extend into the imaginative. Okay, so let's dive in and talk about learning how to see. That might sound a little odd, as most of us can see just fine, but the non-practitioner might be surprised to discover how much of the world that's right in front of us just isn't what it seems. What happens when we're taking in visual information is that our brains are automatically placing an interpretive filter of sorts over our vision and making us see things that are only real in the symbolic sense. It actually takes a lot of effort and training just to be able to see the world as it is in front of us. Those arrangements of color, light, and shape relationships on their own without all the baggage. Our brains are so object and symbol oriented that we're blind to the basic visual components that make up the objects that we can recognize. Take for instance this drawing I'm working on right now. People who have training in the fundamentals will be able to spot early on that what I'm drawing here is an eye, as they can recognize the assembly of abstract shapes that will come together and create the appearance of a convincing eye. When folks who don't have observational training attempt to draw an eye, what usually comes out is a football-shaped outline with a circle in the middle and some lines for lashes, and then they often think that they suck at drawing because what looks like an eye in their mind's eye isn't at all what an eye actually looks like. Having this interpretive overlay on top of our vision you know, makes sense evolutionarily speaking, I presume, so that we can identify important items based on limited information, such as silhouettes, facial expressions, and such. I mean, it is pretty remarkable that with just a quick glance, we can tell we're looking at a tiger, giraffe, lion, etc. Another prime example of how our brains automatically perceive reality on symbolic terms is how we see color. When we look out onto a landscape of rolling hills, for example, our brains tell us that those hills in the distance are green like the ones that we're standing on, despite the fact that they're actually blue when seen from a distance because of atmospheric perspective. Along these same lines, a common tendency of amateur artists is to assign solid colors to entire objects. Take this quote unquote, yellow lemon, for example. Is it really just yellow? Your brain wants to see it that way, but it's not. And that goes for the quote unquote, white wall and windowsill in this, in this image as well. It's even more the case regarding skin tones. If you just slap down a bunch of pink paint to depict a fair skinned individual, it's gonna look ridiculous. Likewise, if you paint a darker skin tone person with just brown paint, it also just doesn't look right. That's because you're gonna see a spectrum of color no matter the ancestry of the person you're painting. Okay, so in essence, learning how to quiet the symbolic mind so that we can just see the world as it simply stands before us is the first major mountain to climb in learning how to draw and paint. The second major pillar in building an artistic foundation is learning how to simplify visual complexity in an elegant way. Once we're able to observe the world without all the symbolic filters, we need a new way to organize the overwhelming complexity that floods our perception. Now you have the raw data, but you need a way to organize it. Let's have a look at this bark plate, for example which were a series of lithographs used in the French academies in the 1700s to train artists. Notice how all of the musculature along the back is simplified. All this complexity is reduced down to the single diagonal that averages all these twists and turns along the core shadow. Here it dips down where the light catches the column of the, of the erector spinae, where it meets the cast shadow from the other side of the ridge. Notice here the continuation of that same diagonal that terminates along this angle change along the contours of the oblique. So you can start to see why I include this term elegant simplification instead of just simplification. As the three-dimensional forms are simplified into two-dimensional shapes that are connected and woven together throughout. When looking at the end product here, it seems fairly straightforward, but trust me, it's much more difficult when you're looking at a three-dimensional figure to not get bogged down by the details and see how it all fits together elegantly. Learning how to see the forest through the trees 
and not get lost in detail takes a lot of energy. And I'd also argue this is one of the greatest challenges of modern life. Learning how to wrestle with complexity and then weave it into something beautiful in art gives us a tangible model of how we might approach that problem in other areas of our lives. This is one of the reasons why I think this practice can be valuable not just for career artists and wish it was more widely offered within our educational systems at large. The third major pillar in building your artistic foundation is learning how to design and create new compositions using the tools of observation and elegant simplification. In short, we use the ingredients of the real in order to create the imaginative. In the curriculum I teach, we have exercises such as the rock project, where we study a rock for its visual properties, draw that rock, and then make up a new rock that's derivative of the same lighting conditions, level of planar versus round facets, quality of texture, etc. We can then use that knowledge to create something that may not exist in physical reality, but is still based off its principles. Another example is the mechanical object project. The task being to first draw an actual object and then morph its simplified forms into something else. In this case, a truck is reshaped into a building. And we also practice extending out from observation into the imaginative by inventing new environments around a figure pose in the life room. This kind of training paves the foundation for being able to create imaginative works. But it's also an exercise for the mind being able to look at reality and imagine the potential of what's possible. When these three pillars are solidly in place, the abilities to observe, simplify, and reshape, it forms a triad that's more than the sum of the parts. And this is where the real art happens in my opinion, meaning the process of weaving new creations not only from your visual observations, but also from your life experience and mental maps. As we are shaped by culture, we in turn utilize tools such as language and art to reshape culture itself. For thousands of years, this has been the mechanism from which cultural evolution has taken place, and I'd argue is central to the purpose of art. It's often overlooked how much of our daily reality is the product of human design. For instance, money only holds value because we collectively imagine it to be so. Given that reality is essentially a co-authored story, I think it's prudent to anchor this narrative in our observations of the natural world from which we originate and script it as much as possible based on our direct experiences. And as humans aren't just floating brains in jars, our direct experience encompasses our entire being. Science has increasingly revealed that the conceptual separation between the mind and the body is false. And the bi-directional communication between the gut and the brain highlights the profound influence of the body on the brain. So the thing is that when new students are first learning how to draw with their whole arm and body stance, and observe and capture those essential qualities of the figure on the model stand, they're not just learning how to make pictures, they're also learning how to think by doing. With the arrival of AI, humans aren't the only ones on the block anymore with the power to author the next chapter of our cultural reality. Though powerful as it is, none of its outputs stem from the direct experience of a living, breathing person in this world. So however we engage with the creative process, with AI or without, and in whatever creative path we pursue, there is no substitute for how we shape our minds with the tools we learn. No matter how good technology gets, we should never lose sight of that.